announce uh, not only our uh, superintendent for the Western Ontario District of Canada, our churches. I think we have over 330 churches in our district. I'm not sure, Laurie. Is that? So I did a bit of research, so I just wanted to make sure I'm right. Three, 350. Wow, we've been growing, I guess. I don't know, but that, that's good. That's a good sign. And uh, Lori Gibbons is also a friend of mine, personal friend of mine I've known uh, for many years. Uh, when I went to Brantford, my family and I, in 1996. My gosh. And I shortly met Lori after that, uh, pastoring New Life uh, Assembly in, uh, in Brantford. And uh, we connected with uh, the ministerials and we had a great time together. We just uh, played hockey together. It's hard to imagine, but we played hockey together. He was a goalie. And I, I think uh, I had a hard time scoring on him, but I, I think I got one by you after all those years. Just one went in. But uh, we had a great time together. We just appreciate him so much. Appreciate his leadership. Appreciate his humility. Appreciate who he is as a man of God and a leader in our assemblies. And so I'd like us all please to welcome Lori Gibbons this morning. Praise God. Well, it is a tremendous uh, honor today to be here, share the word with you, experience, first of all, this morning, your prayer meeting before the service was amazing, just incredible. Um, I felt like I'd already been to church before I got to church. Yeah, it was amazing. And then to be part of your worship service today and experience the presence of the Lord uh, my life has been blessed already by being here and being part of what's happening here in this church. I appreciate your pastor and his wife so much. As Pastor Dino has said, he and I go back a number of years to uh, the days in uh, Brantford, uh, even before he came to pastor in Brantford, enjoying the days when he was an evangelist, would come to Brantford, hold special meetings. People's lives would be changed and touched. And... Uh, I appreciate so much his uh, prayer life, the example that he leads in the presence of the Lord, and his preaching, which is dynamic, obviously uh, not short, but dynamic. <laughs> Don't tie me this morning. <laughs> me this morning. I got it. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> it's amazing today uh, to be able to see this kind of crowd here. And uh, interesting, as you said, only one visitor. So what, like what you said is that these are people who make this a place of worship for you and your families. Uh, I believe that the message I shared this morning is a message that I share in many different places now that I travel around our district because it's the, it's the passion of my heart as a district superintendent. I do appreciate so much that this church is part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, part of our Western Ontario district. Uh, you're very much a uh, church that supports our district, shows love and support to us. We appreciate you so much. We appreciate your eldership, your board, your pastoral staff. And uh, you are an example to many in our fellowship of a church that loves to worship and praise God, loves to experience the Pentecostal message, and is a growing church. And uh, you're very much a part of our, our fellowship of churches. And as a superintendent, I'm honored today that you would invite me to come and share. I hope as I share, you get the feel of what God is doing in our lives as a denomination and as a fellowship. Uh, I believe that God is able to touch and heal and transform lives. I believe that there are many times when I need to come and receive from the Lord. So the message I preached this morning isn't because I don't believe that. I do believe that. In fact, a few years ago, uh, after a long period of difficulty, I was diagnosed with an issue that meant that my leg would be amputated within four or five days. 
So laying on a bed on a Sunday night, knowing that I was facing the amputation of my right leg, I began to pray to the Lord and ask God for healing because I was desperate. While I was praying, God told me three things he wanted me to do. I didn't, I said, God, that's not kind of how it works. I'm supposed to be praying for healing here and now you're, but God was telling me three things and, and then relaying to my life things that I needed to change and do. And I was uh, desperate. I was desperate to do anything to, to see this thing diverted. And while I was praying, some pastor had called and left a message on my cell phone. And I didn't get the message while I was praying, but after I finished praying, I answered the cell phone and it was a message that was left for me by a pastor who was praying for me on the phone and he he left the message and he said, dear God, you need to heal our district superintendent. You need to heal his body, Lord, and you need to change the situation around in the 11th hour. And And as you do, Lord, there are three things that you are going to teach him as you do this. And he named the very three things that I'd been talking to God about. It was a confirmation in my heart that God was doing something. Within the next 24 hours, the blackness in the leg that was there started to sort of dissipate a little bit. There was a change in the wounds a little bit. By Thursday, I went to the specialist and he said, well, I'm not going to do anything right now because it looks like, which is impossible, that you're starting to heal. And he said, you're a bishop or something, aren't you? And, and I said, well, kind of, yeah. And he goes, well, whatever you people are doing, keep doing it. He said, this is a good thing. And so as the weeks went on, everything cleared up, and I'm here today with a right leg. Uh, I sit sometimes during the worship service just so I can stand when I'm speaking. I have no feeling in my legs or my feet. There's some issues with that, but hey, praise God, I got my right leg. And uh, when I'm sitting, don't think I'm boycotting your worship service. It's nothing to do with that. I'm just sitting to get strength so I can speak. But God is good to us. And there are many times God blesses us. But this morning, this message I speak is not for you. This morning is a different morning. And I turn the Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And I want to talk about this morning the fact that there's sometimes the message isn't for us. I mean, many times it is. And, and so I say that at the beginning so you know many times God blesses us. Many times we come and we need a touch from God. And even this morning in this message, if you need a touch from God, God's still able to touch you in this service. But generally what I speak this morning is really not for you. If you're a Christian and you're a believer, it's for somebody else. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, to behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, of course, they said to the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but it's those who are sick that need the doctor. Go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For if I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Interesting story that I heard told by a man by the name of Daryl Strawberry. Daryl Strawberry was a great baseball player in his day. During the 90s, he was one of the best there ever was. He uh, was voted to the All-Star team eight years in a row, and he won four world championships. 
Daryl Strawberry struggled constantly throughout his career with drugs and alcohol. In fact, he was uh, suspended several times during his career for substance abuse. When his career ended, of course, he was a millionaire many times over with fame and, and uh, a candidate for the Hall of Fame. But he still struggled, and after his career was over, probably struggled worse than he had during his career. And because of drugs and alcohol, Daryl Strawberry lost basically everything he ever gained. He lost his money, he lost his reputation, lost his family. At the lowest ebb of his life following his career, Daryl Strawberry was in a very difficult moment. He'd lost it all and was even at the point of wanting to sell one of his World Series rings so he could have more drugs and alcohol at the bottom of the, the heap where he was just about ready to kind of live under a bridge. He said to God, just kill me. Just kill me. Let's get it over with. Just kill me. Now, Daryl Strawberry says this. He says, when he said that to God, he heard God say, you know, Daryl, I'd like to. <laughs> but it's not always about you, Daryl. Daryl had never ever heard that said to him, and in his spirit he thought, but it's always about me. It's always been about me. Ever since I was a little boy, it was about me. I'm talented, I'm gifted, and I'm an athlete. People always wait on me. People always, and even when he thought about that, he thought, well, it's true. I'm asking God to change me so that I can get my money back and get my family back and get my career back. And, and, and he felt like Jesus said to him, Daryl, I'm going to save you. I'm going to change you. I'm going to cleanse you. and I'm going to redeem you. But it's not so you can get everything back, Daryl. I'm going to do it so I can use you for my glory. I'm going to do it so I can use you as an example of my grace. I'm going to do it so you can preach the gospel, so that you can share your testimony, so that you can help other people. Yeah, Daryl, I'm going to change you. I'm not changing you so you can get everything back. I'm changing you so I can use you for my glory. Daryl said he learned something that wasn't always about him. Well, sometimes, folks, I think the church needs to know it's not always about us. The church isn't always here just so we can get blessed, just so we can be helped, just so we can receive. There's some people believe that the church is really their church. I've heard them say that. You know, when they talk to the district and they're mad at me, they'll say, well, it's not your church. And I'll say, no. And they go, well, it's my church. I said, well, not really. It's not my church, and it's not your church. How many know it's God's church? Yeah. Some people believe it's their church because they bought the piano for the church. Or they bought the pews for the church. I remember I pastored when I was very young, 26 years old. I was the lead pastor of a church where the lady had bought the piano for the church. She bought the piano for the church. She, she was the only one to play the piano in the church. And when she went on holidays, she locked the piano of the church <laughs> so nobody else could play because that was her piano. It's not always about us, folks. Sometimes it's about them. If you read through what I shared with you in Matthew, Jesus is with publicans and sinners and the first criticism that comes is why is he not spending time with us? We're the religious we're the, we're the people who he should really be giving his attention to. And Jesus makes some startling, startling statements when he says, it is not those that are well that need the doctor, it is those that are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Proverbs 11 verse 30 says, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life and he that will win a soul is wise. Matthew 4, 19 says, those who have insight, those who have wisdom, will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. And of course, Matthew 28, verse 19 says, go, 
It doesn't say stay, it says go. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The great challenge for all of us today is that we need to go. We need to go wherever we go, and where we go, we share, and where we go, we care, and where we go, we tell, and we share, and we tell people, Jesus wants to set you free, and we want to be part of leading you to Jesus and discipling you while we still have time. Some startling statistics of our district is what caused me to begin to to preach this message, to, to look at the 300 and, <clears throat> back then, 320 churches we had. And out of those 320 churches, over 75 of those churches could not identify having won one person to Christ in the whole year. 75 churches and not one person saved in a whole year. When I looked at those statistics, I said, Jesus, is that true? Not one person came to Jesus in a whole year in a church? And that became startling to me. And I said this in a, in a service. I said, so, you, so not one person come to Christ all year. So could you not even just go to a senior's home? I mean, just go find somebody who's 80 years old. I mean, who's got 10 days to live and just tell them about Jesus. Get them to nod their head. Do something. <laughs> now, when I said that, a lady came to me at Braceside a few weeks after I said that in the church. And she said, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. Whenever they say that, it's not, never good news. <laughs> and I said, yes. She said, you preached in our church. Yes. And you said that... Uh, that we should even just go to a senior's home and, and, and find somebody and get them to nod their head. Do you remember saying that? I said, yes. She said, well, that really convicted me. She said, that really spoke to my heart. She said, it really troubled me. And she, but I went home that afternoon. It really troubled me. And I told my husband how troubled I was because our next door neighbor had just gone to a senior's home only a week before. This was an older lady. And she said, and we never thought of going visiting them. We never thought anything of it until you said that. And she said, I want you to know, because I was so convicted by what you said, I actually went to the seniors' home that week with my husband, and we visited our neighbor. And when we got there, our neighbor was so upset because he was just told he could never go back home, and this is going to be his environment for the rest of his life. And he was upset, and his wife was upset. So we sat down, and we shared with them. And then we said, do you know Jesus could help you? And they said, never heard about Jesus. So we talked about Jesus, and then we told them that he could. And she said, then they prayed, and they accepted Jesus. And now we're going back every week, and we're going to disciple him for the Lord. She said, Pastor Lori, 50 years I've been in a Pentecostal church and I've never once told anybody about Jesus. And she said, what I did that day was because you told me that it was easy. And she said, it is easy. And she said, it's the most amazing thing that our neighbor has come to Jesus. Folks, that's all I'm saying today. Yes, it's about Jesus and, and us when it comes to he blesses us and he touches us and he ministers to us. Of course, and you come to a great church where the presence of the Lord is real. If you can't feel the presence of the Lord in this place, you got big trouble because I could feel his presence when I came into the prayer meeting. <laughs> and all of that is amazing. Of course it is. I don't discount it. Please don't take this message wrong. I don't discount it. But folks, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit was poured out so we would be his witnesses. It wasn't just so that we would be blessed. It wasn't just so we would be touched. It wasn't just so we could be experiencing his presence, but so that we would be empowered to go and share the message of Jesus with others and see them come to Christ and then disciple them in the name of Jesus. Go and make disciples. We've got churches that pride themselves on being seeker-sensitive. They talk about it, which means that they're trying to relate to people and want people to come and be comfortable on a Sunday. So I'm not ever going to, to, uh, to 
discourage people who, who believe that they want to do that because then there's the other people who say we're not secret sensitive, but we're spiritually sensitive. And they say you come and, and spiritually receive of the Lord. So both churches, praise God, they're preaching the gospel. Like Paul said, I'm not about to be here to argue. Remember Paul said that? He didn't say it in the younger days because I think Paul was different as he got older. But how many know we all get better as we get older, right? A little bit more wiser. Hopefully. Although I have met some miserable old people, and uh, I don't want to be that miserable old guy. I'm getting old now, so I don't want to be that miserable old guy. You know those guys? Nobody wants to be around them. I want to be a real nice old guy. (laughs) That's another story. But the bottom line is that how important it is to understand that Jesus is talking to us about being sinner sensitive. Not just seeker sensitive, not just spiritually sensitive. Becoming sensitive to sinners. Becoming people who who are passionate about God's presence to reveal to us someone who needs our help, someone who needs our love, someone who... So what would a church be like if it became sinner-sensitive? Well, first of all, they'd have to love sinners. How many know you can't reach sinners if you don't love sinners? As I'm convinced, there's some Christians don't even like sinners, actually. In fact, they're very hostile towards sinners. You know what it's like. You're there on a hot day on Sunday in your church, and you go home, and You drive into your neighborhood and you drive into your driveway and there's that neighbor sitting under that umbrella, sitting there in the shorts and t-shirt, drinking that beer and you get out of your car and go, there he is again. There he is again. You go and you have to work every day with ungodly people and you're just so thankful to God to get away from them. How many know you, you're never going to reach sinners until you start to love sinners? Jesus loved sinners. Jesus was with the publicans and sinners. He was with the tax collectors. That's why it was so hard to believe. Why would Jesus be with them? I'm here to tell you, if you can't be with them, you won't reach them. Amen? Now, you're not with them so you can become like them. If that's the case, well, then you're just a very immature Christian. But we're with them so we can touch their lives, so that we can reach them, so that we can love them and love sinners. When I was a young man, I heard a church leadership uh, speaker speak, and he told the story of the Albuquerque cocktail waitress. Ever hear the story of the Albuquerque cocktail waitress? A guy by the name of Jack Whitesall used to tell this story. How that the Albuquerque cocktail waitress worked in a hotel and a Christian girl from the local church had been working there in the hotel in another part of the hotel and they got to know each other. The Christian girl was friendly. She cared for the Albuquerque cocktail waitress and eventually she shared Jesus with her and the Albuquerque cocktail waitress got saved. Then she brought her to church with her. And the first week she came to church, the pastor talked about a water baptismal service and said, if you want to be baptized in water, then you can meet me after the service. So the young girl asked the Albuquerque cocktail waitress, do you want to be baptized? And she said, yes. So they went to the meeting. At the meeting, the pastor told them what they had to do to prepare for next week. And and he had a little invitation. He said, you might want to take one or two of these invitations and give them out to your friends so that they would come and see you be baptized next week. So the Albuquerque cocktail waitress got all excited and said, can I have 200 of those? He said, 200? She said, yeah, I got all kinds of friends. So she took 200 uh, brochures and she gave them out all week. And the next Sunday when she was baptized in water, 150 of her friends came on Sunday. The pastor gave an invitation at the end of the message and 100 of them lifted their hands for salvation. Because the Albuquerque cocktail waitress had a lot of friends. How many friends do you have? I think it's wonderful to have Christian friends. I think that's amazing. But folks, how many friends do we have that don't know Jesus? 
Because you can't win a sinner unless you love a sinner. You have to be with sinners. You have to find a place to, to reach out to sinners. I mean, how many know that as a Christian, every one of us can have a sinner? How many, how many know there's enough out there? How many know everybody can get one? And if you can't find one, I'll help you find one. We'll go to Horton's and we'll find one right there, right there at the counter. We'll, we'll find one that you can have. And you can show love to and care for. Begin to share Jesus with them. The second thing a church would be is a church that would be led by the Spirit. This is a work of the Spirit, folks. He anointed us. He poured his power upon us to be his witnesses. This isn't selling Amway here. We're not out selling vacuum cleaners. We're out sharing the love of Jesus with people. This is the work of the Spirit. Now, I cannot argue someone into the kingdom. I cannot take tracks and bang them over the head and make them get right with Jesus. Because the Bible says that nobody comes to the Father, but the Holy Spirit draws them. That's what it says. So it's not like making a sales deal. It's not like trying to convince them and, and then get them to sign on the dotted line. It's being sensitive to the Spirit. It's being led of the Spirit. It's letting the Holy Spirit lead us. It's getting up every morning and saying, Jesus, I work with a bunch of ungodly people every day, so lead me by your Spirit. Help me to sense by your Holy Spirit when to say what I should say and how to do this, Lord. Lead me, guide me, direct me. And when it is an opportunity to share, let me share and love the, me the message of Jesus with somebody's life. And then let me care for them and reach to them and help them. Folks, you get into being used of God like this and it is a spirit journey and it is incredible I wish sometimes I didn't believe this message because I have no time to do this stuff but how do I say no to this I spend most of my time with religious leaders I spend most of my time in business meetings or services I spend most of my time leading pastors and leaders. I don't have time to reach out to sinners. I'm too busy trying to help all the people that should know better. But I can't help myself. They come into my life. What am I going to do? I mean, it really is it's crazy. Young man that I knew many years ago, he became... A person that I felt like I should make a phone call to. I hadn't seen him in 12 years. And I felt like God was saying, you need to give this guy a call. And I said, Lord, I, I'm busy. I got all kinds of new people. I, that guy's in my past. And God kept saying, no, I want you to call him. I want you to call him. I want you to call him. So finally I said, okay, one phone call. How back can this be? So I make a phone call to him. He says to me, why are you calling me right now? I said, I don't know. I said, you've been on my heart. What's happening? Are you doing well? I, can we meet for coffee? I mean, right away? I said, sure. It was late at night. So we got in my car and traveled and went. Had a coffee. He said, you're not going to believe this. He said, I was sitting on our table in our house. And my wife and I were breaking up right then. And when you called, you called just as my wife, Veronica, was leaving me. And he said, Pastor Roy, how did you know? I didn't know. I said, I just had a nudge of the spirit. I didn't know. He said, Pastor Roy, can you help me? Well, that started my journey. <laughs> what am I going to say? I said, yeah, I guess I'll help you. And it's been a long journey for two years. And uh, got him into rehab in Guelph. He, he's back with his wife and family. They're serving the Lord. But then he says to me, Pastor Lori, what you did for me, you got to do for a number of other guys that know you in the city, and you got to do something to help them. I says, Donnie, I got no time to. But Pastor Lori, what are we going to do? He said, You got it. I said, Okay, 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 okay. What? We'll start a small group. <laughs> so now I got a small group. I didn't want a small group. I don't need a small group. But guess what? I got a small group. 
of a whole bunch of other guys who are hooked on cocaine and alcoholics and drunks and want to know how to live for Jesus. And now I've got a whole thing going. I didn't even want to have it, you know. I had to call the pastor of the local church and say, please, can I have the, the benefit of, of making sure they all go to your church? I don't want to, you know, I'm just, like, I don't want to start a church. Like, I'm just trying to help somebody here. You get on the line and you get on the road of letting the Holy Spirit lead you. He, the Spirit of God, will help you to know what to say and what to do. But there is no greater life in our, in our lives as Christians than to be sharing Jesus with people and discipling for the Lord. <clears throat> so a church, a church that wants to be sinner sensitive will love sinners will be led by the Spirit and will live out our faith every day with integrity, honesty, and with faithfulness. And as you live out your faith every day for the Lord Jesus, someone will notice. Someone will notice what effect you're having on them and want to know what makes you so different. And at that moment, you're able to tell them about the love of Jesus. The greatest reputation we have, folks, is being people of integrity, people of faithfulness, people others can trust, and people others want to be like. The most important thing is my lifestyle every day is living for Jesus and sharing Jesus. I met some Christians that are more miserable than, than sinners that I know. They work in a, in, a, in, a, in a place and nobody trusts them. And everybody knows that they're the most cantankerous. They're the ones always causing trouble, always trying to, you know, milk the system. And then at some point they say to people, oh, we have a special meetings at our church. Wouldn't you like to come? The people that work with them know, no, 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 we're happy. We really don't want to have what you have, <laughs> Do we live the kind of lifestyle that makes other people want what you have? That makes other people want to be drawn to you because of the peace in your life and because of the, the power and the presence of Jesus? It's an amazing story. How many ever remember the name of Gavin McLeod? Now, if you're older like me, you'd remember Gavin McLeod. He was the uh, captain on the love boat. Do you remember? Captain Steubing. He was on the Mary Tyler Moore show. He was Murray on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Well, at the height of Gavin McLeod's career, at the height of his career, he was one of the highest paid Hollywood actors in the TV industry. He decided to change his lifestyle. Decided he didn't want to be married to his wife, Patty, anymore. Decided that he didn't want to have to be bound by that marital uh, commitment and didn't want to have to be involved in that way, and so he uh, decided to end his marriage and move into a new lifestyle, a new chapter of his life. He was at the height of his game, and, and uh, so that's what he pursued. That time, his wife, Patty, just had met some Hollywood wives who were Christians. She had just started going to a Bible study. And as Gavin left her and they separated, she began to become involved in a prayer meeting and a Bible study. And so eventually, within weeks, she gave her heart to Christ. And then she began to pray for her marriage. She began to pray that her husband would come back. And so much so that as she was in that prayer meeting, week in and week out, she began to make a commitment. And the commitment she made was that she was going to pray for her husband every day, and then at supper, she was going to make supper for him and believe that every night when she made supper, some night he would come back. And so she began to make supper for him. And every night she would make supper and put a place setting out and put out the knives, the forks and the spoons and, 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 and prepare as if he was going to eat supper. And she did it for two and a half years, believing that sometime he would come back. Within two and a half years, things in his personal life got very difficult. And in fact, he eventually met an, an, a Christian who shared their faith. And he himself began to want to give his heart to Christ. And he felt like he needed to get his 
Mary's back together. So he called Patty one night and said, can I come and see you? And he came after two and a half years to their home. And Patty opened the door and he said, Patty, I need to tell you, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Would you ever take me back? I'm making change in my life. I'm coming to Christ. And I wonder, would you ever take me back? And she said, take you back. I've been making supper for you for two and a half years. And he came in, and the rest is history, and they travel the country. At least they have been sharing their testimony of Jesus. You know what, folks? God can do amazing things even in your own family. God can do amazing things even with your own children. Amen? But you got to learn to build a bridge. You can't build a wall. You build a wall, you drive them away, you build a bridge, and Jesus will help you. So the message this morning may not be for you, so you would be blessed, but it may be for someone else that you will help them and that you will reach them and that you will touch them. They said to Jesus, why do you eat with publicans and sinners? Jesus says, because those who know Christ, they don't need the physician. It's those that are sick that need the physician. I come to call sinners to repentance through you and through me. Let me close with this today. I read an amazing book recently called A POW Story. A POW Story, actually the title in it is POW Story, I'm No Hero. It's written by Charles Plum. Charles Plum is a uh, man who served in the U.S. Air Force. He was a fighter pilot during the Vietnam War and actually shot down over North Vietnam and spent several months in a POW camp, tortured and uh, had an amazing story. He writes about it in the book. But in the book, he talks about after the war was over, he came home to the United States. He's actually out in a restaurant one night having dinner with his wife and his children. While he was having dinner in the restaurant, the book talks about it. You can, you can actually Google the stories. So he used to be able to tell stories like this and exaggerate, but you can't anymore because now everybody goes home and Googles the story. And so you've got to be fairly accurate, right? Whole new day. You'll find the story in the book. He was in a restaurant with his family, and there was somebody sitting across from the restaurant. His wife noticed the guy staring at them. And then she became very uncomfortable as the guy was apparently kind of trying to get their attention. And she said that to her husband. She said, I'm really uncomfortable with somebody just across the room here in the restaurant. And they seem to be staring at us constantly and trying to get our attention. Finally, the man got up from the seat and came over. When he came over, he said, I don't want to disturb your supper, and I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you, but I just have to ask you this. Are you Captain Plum? And Charles said, well, I was Captain Plum, yes. He said, were were you a fighter pilot during the the Vietnam War? He said, yes. Were you on the aircraft carrier, the Kitty Hawk? He said, yes, I was. He said, well, you wouldn't know me, but he said, I knew you. He said, we knew all the fighter pilots. But he said, I knew you really specifically. I knew you personally, though you don't know who I am. Really? He said, yeah. Because he said, I packed your parachute every day. And he said, and I always wanted to ask. Because you were shot down, right? Yeah. How'd the parachute work? (laughs) Charles Plum said, work it saved my life and the man said well I was honored sir to be able to pack your parachute every day and he stuck his hand down and said thank you for the privilege and the honor to pack your parachute Charles Plum took his hand and said thank you sir you saved my life you saved my life so all Jesus asks is that you go every day and just pack somebody's parachute.
I want you to bow your heads this morning. Just like we would in a service where you were going to get a touch from God. The musicians may want to come back. It's like a service where we would ask you to to share your need. Be prayed for. But now we sit for somebody else this morning. We sit for somebody else. We sit for somebody else that we know needs Jesus. We sit for somebody else that we know is far from the Lord. We sit in his presence for a moment. Think about somebody else. Somebody that we know is far from Jesus. Has tremendous burdens and is tremendously hurting. Tremendously needs Jesus because it's not always about us, folks. Sometimes it's about them. So who's going to reach them? Who's going to reach them? Jesus wants us to reach them. Jesus wants us to share with them. Jesus wants us to love them. Jesus wants us to be led by the Spirit on how we reach them. Jesus wants us to live an example before them. Build a bridge, not a wall. Because somebody's life's in danger this morning. Somebody's life's in peril this morning. And the Holy Spirit is here to place them on your heart. To place them right on your heart. That's how this church will grow. This church isn't going to grow necessarily just by taking people from some other church. Though people will come from other churches, that's fine. That's not a problem. But that's not the vision and passion of the church. not what it should be. The vision and passion of the church should be that there are people that need Jesus. We want to see them come to Jesus. And we want to see them come to church. And we want them to see them come, become part of this family because they need Jesus. Because they're dying without Christ. Because they need a Savior. Jesus, as our heads are bowed this morning, put a passion and burden on our hearts for somebody else. For somebody else. For somebody who needs the Lord. For somebody who needs you, Jesus. Show us how to reach them. Show us what to say. Show us what to do. In fact, this morning with heads bowed, if there's somebody here and you don't know Jesus, then this morning we say to you, look, at you can receive Jesus right now in this service. You can know Christ as your personal Savior. Jesus loves you, and Jesus wants you to receive him this morning because he loves you, he cares for you. All these people are an evidence that Jesus can change lives and set you free. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ, just lift your hand. Say, I need Jesus this morning. I need Jesus this morning. I need him right now in my life. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, convince us this morning by your presence and power that we need to share your love with people. Convict us this morning. Convict us this morning. And as the music's playing, if you know somebody that God's putting on your heart and you believe that the Lord is speaking to your heart for somebody else this morning, just stand where you are this morning. Just stand. Just stand for somebody else. Not about you. Just stand for somebody else. Stand for somebody else all over this place. Stand for somebody else. Stand for somebody else. Say, I I bring them to you. Bring them to the Father right now. Say their name this morning. Say their name. Bring the name to Jesus. Lord Jesus, we bring our names to you this morning. Jesus, lead and direct and guide us that we would share you this week with others. That, Lord Jesus, we would tell others about you, Lord. God, you would lead us by your spirit. That you would show us, Lord Jesus, what it means to be sinner sensitive. Sensitive to sin. Lord, the testimony will be as people come to know you, a Savior and Lord, begin to come to the church together with us. Fill these seats with people who have come to Jesus because we we cared enough to share with them. Help us to pack somebody's parachute this week. Help us to pack somebody's parachute this week and save their life. In 
name of Jesus, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Pray right now, the Lord will use you. Jesus, use us, God. Use us with your glory. Use us with your might and your power. Bless us, Lord Jesus, as we bless others. Precious, precious name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you redeemed us, God. Thank you, Jesus. God, do it for someone else. In the precious, precious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, Pastor. Praise God. Great to be with you. May God bless you. We want to pray together. You're standing for somebody else. Maybe a, a parent, maybe a a son, a cousin, an uncle, a neighbor, someone at work. We're going to go a little deeper this morning. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask you. As Brother Pastor Lori has asked you to stand to bring that name. What, I, what I'm going to ask you to do is as we're going to begin to pray. I'm going to open up in prayer. I want you just to declare that name before the Lord verbally. Just declare that name to the Lord verbally. As we are praying, it could be a neighbor, it could be a cousin, could be an aunt, could be a friend, could be a brother. I don't know. We're going to begin to pray right now. And you just declare, just bring that name before the Lord as we're praying right now. Can you do that? Can we just go a little further? Father, we want to thank you for this precious word this morning. Father, indeed, you have blessed us that we would be a blessing. You have blessed us so that we can be the salt of this earth. That we can bring something to someone else. As Ezekiel who sat where they sat. Father, we want to sit where they sit this morning. We want to lift up their names. We lift up their names verbally to you, Lord. My aunt, my uncle, my cousin, my daughter, my brother, my son. My father, my mother. We lift them up before you, my neighbor. That person at work, that person at school. We lift them up right now, Lord. Here's their name. We ask you, Lord, to speak to their hearts even now as we pray. Just as Pastor Lori, Lord, when you spoke to him about those three things, and good enough, somebody called and told him the very three things that you were speaking to him about. My God, you are a very present help in time of... Lord, I pray that you would begin to speak to these people even now as we are praying that you would allow them to see your love, that you would allow them to see their need of you. You would touch them. And Father, we'll remember this day that we prayed for them. I pray, Lord, that you would go deep into their hearts. That they will see their need of who you are. And their need to give their lives to you. Deep is calling unto deep, Lord. We are hungering to see lives touched. Now, one more thing. I want everybody to look at me for a second. All of you know, only one guest today. If you, only one guest today. That's rare. But I say that to say this. All of you know who know who've been in this church for a period of time know that we've been crying out, fasting, seeking God for one thing primarily. What we sang about for God to move. Not so that we can grow in numbers, please, but that we can make a difference in this world. That's what it's all about. That's what revival is all about. And I'm going to ask everybody to join hands to your neighbor. Because we are going to pray for Logos now that you would be that light in this world. That this church would be a hospital for the brokenhearted. That this church will be a well for those who are thirsty. That this church will be some kind of a food bank, if you will, for those that are hungry for bread, for water, and that this church would have a key, 
that key is Christ that would open up the prison gate for those who are in the bondage of sin. Can you pray along with me? That God will use you. Yes, not Lori or me or her or the board. Your life. You are the salt. You are the light. You can reach people that I can never reach. You can touch people in a way I can't. Because God's called you to make a difference. Your life, in your home, in your environment, where you're at. We're going to believe God that God's going to use you in a powerful way. Because what does salt do? Salt creates thirst. Salt brings healing. Salt brings flavor. That's what you're called to do and to be. I want to pray right now. Father, you see the hands that are joined together. And Father, we've been praying night and day to see a move of God because as Lori said, we can't draw them, only you can draw people. Father, we can say a lot of words, but unless those words are anointed by your spirit, unless, unless Father, you send us, unless, unless something happens outside of this natural realm, then Father, nothing can really happen. But Lord, we stand before you as a willing people. Because all you're asking us is to be willing. You're asking us to go. And you do the rest. You're asking us to speak. But you will speak through us. You asked us to be the light. But it is your light through us. It is your grace. Your presence. The anointing that breaks the yoke. And so Father, as we hold hands together this morning. We are declaring our desire as one body to do what you've called us to do, to be what you've called us to be, a light in this world. Father, I pray that you will use Logos, use us to see many lights touched. Somehow use us that this church will be more than just a building made out of brick and mortar. But that this church will be a lighthouse, a church, Lord, that will be able to, to be something more than just a building in some corner. The people will come, Lord, from the highways and byways. Those who are thirsty will come and drink. Those that are hungry will come and eat. Those that are in bondage, depressed. Those who are oppressed would find deliverance and healing. That we will see Isaiah 61 become a reality in our midst. The Lord has come to set the captives free. For I declare it I, unto you. We declare we, our willingness to be that person, to be that church. Be glorified in our midst this morning. That the name of the Lord will be magnified throughout this city. And this nation, as we stand firm before a mighty God, be exalted, we pray, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Can we give a praise this morning? Brother Josh, give us something powerful. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. We give a praise. Before we go, let's sing this to the Lord. God is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Now, brothers and sisters, we heard a, a word that I believe came from the Lord this morning. You know, we've been praying, believing God. But you know, in order for us to experience a move of God, something must be happening in here first. Huh? Something deep within us. You see, you see, Brother Lori, you don't want to witness about Jesus if you haven't experienced something in your own life to begin with. And that's maybe where the problem is. How can I tell someone about Jesus if Jesus isn't real in my own life?
how can I get people excited about Jesus if I'm not excited about Jesus? See, that, that, that's, that's the problem. And that's why we pray for revival. But God is great. And I honestly, sincerely believe that God is going to do something so powerful. For one reason only, because of who he is. And how great is our God. That's what we want people to know. Sing with me. How great My God is our God. speaking to people's hearts I believe the war the, the word of the Lord has spoken and now his spirit is beginning to go deep into people's hearts this morning I sense that very strongly and I don't want to rush this I just want us to be still for a few moments we're going to be dismissed we have a service tonight we want you back I understand all that but I don't want to rush just a few more moments allow the Lord to speak to your hearts about that person you just prayed for Do you know I've been serving God a long time and I remember when I first got saved Pastor Lori I couldn't sleep for the first several months and one of the reasons why I couldn't sleep well is because I started thinking of people who don't know Jesus and it disturbed me so badly I couldn't sleep I remember Pastor Lori, I'd be driving this old car I had in Los Angeles and I would stop at the red light and God would speak to me and I'd begin to cry profusely on the streets of LA as I saw the people passing because I knew that these people were just in despair. You can see it in their faces. And it broke me. I began to weep for these people I don't know. And I said, how can I do that? I remember going, why, why am I doing this? And I really felt strongly that night. And the Lord spoke and said, these are not your tears. These are my tears through you, Dino. And it was shortly after that that I led my first, first person to Christ. On the corner of Western and Wilshire. And I realized why God saved me. It was not so I can be a good preacher or pastor a big church. No, it's not why God saved me. God saved me so I can make a difference in people's lives. That's it. That's it. That's why he saved you. Give a few seconds for the interpretation, please.
Now I'm going to say something before we move on. For those who don't understand what just happened, and I'm going to say something to you, Hosanna. What you just heard now is very scriptural for some that don't understand. The Bible speaks to us in 1 Corinthians 12 about a certain tongue that's given. This is not a personal tongue for edification. This tongue is given, a diver's tongue, in a congregational setting, and you can study the scriptures to see that that's true. That needs to be interpreted. So if this tongue was not interpreted, then we'd have a problem. So this tongue has been interpreted. The Bible calls another gift the interpretation of tongues. Why would it be called interpreted? Because it needs to interpret something that was said that is not understood. The tongue is a heavenly language. It could be a known language. The Bible speaks of that. I'm not here to teach right now this, just to explain. And if you have any questions, you can come see me after. And so what we heard today was a gift of tongues operating with the interpretation. Sometimes interpretations are done by the individual, which is Hosanna, or somebody else. But there must be an interpretation. And I want to say one thing, Hosanna. You have given a few. Today, I sense that the Spirit of God has used you powerfully and accurately because you are sensitive to the leading you were sensitive today and the flesh was not there you obeyed and God used you Hosanna now I want to speak to the congregation what was given today was a confirmation of Pastor Lori's message tongues and interpretation are never given to direct so to speak or to give direction it usually is something that comes along a confirmation of what has already been said and that word was an exact confirmation that what Lori brought to us came from the Lord and it was not just something that we can be excited with it is something to change our lives God is calling us to touch people's lives and please don't be so self-absorbed because you can't be an effective witness if you are self-absorbed and always worried about yourself you cannot effectively reach people like that and that's why Pastor Lori started the message. This is not about you. How apropos was that, brother? Father, we thank you for your word. And thank you for Logos. I thank you for Pastor Lori. I pray what was heard today would not be thrown aside. But that would be absorbed, embraced. That we would be effective ministers of the gospel. We would be light into this world. Salt into this world. That we will see a true move of God and many lives will be touched and they will come and drink and they will come and eat. That your name would be exalted. Use us, Father. We surrender our lives to you right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and we give you all the praise.